how's everything been coming along in the course? Fantastically. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say enough. The, I, I've, I haven't been in this course as long as I was in the previous course, but I've started to get things much more quickly. Things are definitely, especially with the, uh, the logic games, things are really starting to, to sink in and click. Um, I really like the way uh, you just visualize the diagrams and how they seem to be a little bit more intuitive. You can kind of create them spatially in your head. Um, but it, my brain kind of works like that. So it's been, it's been really good. Um, so thank you for that. Awesome. Fantastic. I'm really glad to hear it. What would you say is the biggest challenge or obstacle you're facing right now? Um, really just fitting everything in during my day. I mean, I'm a full-time student. Um, I'm on a quarter schedule, so I'm taking 15 hours. It's very compressed. Uh, and on top of that, I'm TAing another class. Uh, I'd say a research design class of 91 students. Um, so doing a lot of grading, um, my other courses are very writing intensive. I'm doing like an independent study, um, kind of a, a capstone course. And then one last, uh, business statistics class, just, you know, getting that last little requirement out of the way. So it's just finding the flow throughout the day, um, not giving any one thing too much weight. I think the tendency that I've had over the past couple weeks is to um, give too much preferential treatment to studying for the LSAT at the expense of some of my other things. And I'm kind of starting to get a feel for how long things should take. That was, that was one of the big issues in the beginning was, uh, you know, I'd never done anything like a logic game before. So whenever I had like four logic games assigned, it was kind of hard to say like, okay, this will, this will take me about an hour to do these. Um, so I was probably blocking off too much time, but that's, it's kind of starting to figure itself out. I hear you. I hear you. And of course my inclination is to say, devote all your time to the LSAT, forget the other <laughs> stuff. Yeah. But I understand that's not really sustainable and you've got responsibilities. You've got a lot of different things that you're juggling. What's your target test date? So, um, it originally was November the 7th, but I found that that was a little bit too soon. Uh, that was a little bit too compressed and I've been able to slow it down. I pushed it out to the January test date. Um, the schools that I'm applying to all allow the January LSAT. Um, I have them all listed here. My, my prime, my number, the, my goal school is UVA. Um, and they allow, uh, they allow the January LSAT because their, their application date is March 3rd. And I, and I reached out and confirmed with them. Um, but it's a, what is it? January 14th, I believe is what they're saying the date is now. It might move if they go to the flex. It just depends on everything. Yeah. Um, but that's that's my target test date is January. Cool. Well, that means you've got some time. And so if you have more immediate deadlines, you can, of course, meet those other deadlines for your other responsibilities, but you just want to make sure that you are blocking off time for the LSAT so it doesn't go from being a huge focus to being zero focus, somewhere in between. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is... Um, you know, I do have a 4.0 GPA. This is my last quarter in school. And so I do know that, and I, you might be able to confirm this. I had heard that the higher your GPA, the more kind of wiggle room you had with your scores on the LSAT. Um, is that, is that true? Yeah. Well, I mean, law school admissions is primarily numbers driven first LSAT, then GPA, then everything else. But the higher your GPA, yes, the less of an LSAT, the lower an LSAT score you could get away with. So what and a higher LSAT score gives you a bit more wiggle room with your GPA. So it works, it works both ways. Highest numbers in on both is obviously ideal. So just do what you can. But absolutely since your GPA is already pretty solid, that means that you could afford to devote more time to the LSAT. And since the LSAT weighs more heavily than all of your GPA put together, your entire undergrad put together, then it certainly is worth devoting some more time to it this semester. Although you can slow it down a bit because you move to January, meaning you've also got your winter break. Yep. 
And that's, and that's what I've done. And it's, it's definitely improved kind of, you know, the portion everything gets on the, the daily plate, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, I did, I was going to ask your thoughts on, because I'm still signed up for that November LSAT. I haven't, I didn't officially drop it. What are your thoughts on taking multiple exams? I know that some schools want to just see it like you just went for it that one time and then that's it. And then they also offer, uh, what is it, the score saver, where you can view your score before it gets officially reported. What are your thoughts on those? Right. So you've never taken an official LSAT before? No. Nice. Okay. So there's this new policy called score preview, which means that for first time test takers only, you can see your score before deciding whether to cancel. Now, of course, it's always fantastic. If somebody could take it just only once and get a fantastic score, that's obviously great. In my experience, a lot of people, maybe even most people do retake the LSAT and it's totally fine. But if you've got a busy semester and you're fairly confident that November LSAT's not going to reflect your fullest potential, I would not even bother taking it because there's, there's no reason to have a score in your record if you can avoid it. Law gotcha. schools, it's true. Law schools do not average multiple scores. They only take the highest. But still, you don't want a lower score in your record if you can avoid it just because it looks cleaner to have that great score in January versus like a score that's maybe only re reflects half of your studying for November when you're still mm -hmm. going to do a lot more over those next two months between November and January. Makes perfect sense. Awesome. Um, and then the last one was around pacing. Uh, the previous program that I was in was real big on when you're going through your questions, you kind of pick out those those general if questions, you know, you take out your, uh, you know, that, that first question that you always get, that's just your, just your ordering question, get that one out of the way and then jumping around versus going down the list and almost kind of pushed you into guessing on that last question that was usually around, you know, substitution of rules. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Cause I know that sometimes in some of your videos you say, Hey, listen, it might be a better idea to just go through them because by the time you get to that last one, you've done all this work and you have all these multiple diagrams drawn. Yeah. Great question. So I do think there's something, something to be gained in logic games from jumping around a bit because your local diagrams, those if questions can help you solve the more general global questions. As for how that works in practice under timed conditions with the digital or the flex where you can only see one question at a time, you have to play with that and see if it works for you. I think it's worth it's for me, it's worth it, but to each their own, I would try that out a little bit just under the real, the, the real format of the test day itself. But I would never recommend guessing on a rule sub question by default. There are strategies you can apply to solve those. Well, in fact, I did an entire workshop just on rule substitution questions inside the course. So I, I wouldn't want you to sacrifice any questions, but I think point taken that about you, you said that those, those diagrams will help you with the questions you attempt at the end. So all your previous work is available to use and I would maximize the use of it. Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's a good point. And that was one of the issues. I was like, why, why would I just, I mean, I get, you know, I'm running low on time and there's no, you know, points taken away for a wrong answer. So yeah, if you have to guess, but I'm not gonna just like start Christmas treeing no. the last <laughs> questions on the exam. Like that's, you know, that is throwing away points um, yeah. because I, I, and I've seen working through some of these, you know, once you've encountered a few of them, they look intimidating, but I think sometimes that's part of the point is they're just supposed to look kind of mean and angry and intimidating. But once you it's like, Oh no, I know exactly what they're asking for. And it just turns out that I was playing with a diagram that fits this substitution right here perfectly well. And it, you know, the answer just jumps right out at you. So I was curious to see your thoughts. Yeah, that's exactly right. And rule sub really isn't any harder than anything else. As you said, it just looks intimidating. And because they don't come up as frequently as other questions, it seems like they're totally out of left field. But if you drill them, like I recommend, then you can see the patterns and how to approach them. And as you said, previous diagrams can help you out a lot there too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, I mean, those are, those are all the questions that I had. Like I said, I'm, I'm, really enjoying the course so far. I, I know I haven't been able to attend the, um, the evening live sessions and that's just, I, my, my classes run late into the day. Um, but I do hope to make, I'm super analog. Nice. I do hope to make the, uh, 
the workshop tonight because that was on kind of more like general like applications and uh, writing uh, your purpose statement. Yeah. yeah. So tonight we're going to do a law school application essay workshop where students submitted rough drafts. And by the way, feel free to submit yours as well. And I could cover it in a future session. And then we're also doing something unique and new, which is an admissions mastermind session afterwards. So that's a, a place where we're not even going over drafts, but you can just bring your biggest admissions questions. You asked a couple today, but I'm thinking more about things like, what should you write your personal statement about? Or are you considering optional essays and addenda or just challenges around timing in general? It's a place to play with all of those questions too. And so definitely make it if you can. If not, of course, it's recorded. It'll be in the class, in the course later. No, excellent. I really will try and, and make that because there sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so somebody asks a question that's just like, whoa, I didn't even know that was a thing. Good, good to know. Yeah, it's one of the cool things about these live classes that we get to be interactive and you get to benefit from other people's questions too. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks again, Steve. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Paul. Definitely. I'll see you in class soon. Have a good one, man. You too. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.